Welcome to today Riot's talk. This has been um, arranged by Riot's Exeter um, by Ellie Hassan. Unfortunately, she's not very well today, so I'm standing in for her. Thank you for coming along. I've enabled subtitles in several languages, but if there's anything else that we can do to improve accessibility, please let us know. Um, so please join me today in welcoming Dr Owen Tomlinson. Owen's a lecturer in medical science whose research background is in clinical exercise physiology, having obtained his PhD from the University of Exeter in 2018. His clinical research examines how we can use cardiopulmonary exercise testing for people with chronic lung disease to identify causes of poor exercise function and how exercise services are delivered in the NHS. In his education role, he's focused on how students understand and apply critical appraisal alongside interpreting hierarchies of evidence. So this includes awareness of open access practices and predatory publishers, particularly in medicine and medical science. Certainly something which I think we'll all experience. Um, so I'm very interested in hearing more from Owen's talk today. So please use the question and answers on um, Teams to post any questions that you have and I'll post those to Owen after the talk. Ooh, lovely, hey, thank you ever so much uh, Nadia and Ellie uh, as well for inviting me to, to talk today and uh, yeah thank you to all the Riots team for being here and for yourselves for listening. Uh, either live or on demand as well. Um, so as Nadia said, uh, my background is at the University of Exeter and whilst I'm a physiologist, I'm going to be talking to you today uh, about something that's a bit of a, a bane of all our existence and lives in these spam emails that we all incessantly seem to be receiving. And so maybe it is a message like this that creeps into your inbox that resonates with you and so here is one that I've received relatively recently so from the apparent annals of sports medicine where they've called me I'm not going to disagree with them calling me a professor that's very very sweet of them but obviously they're barking up the wrong tree um, and they've copied and pasted a paper I've written but only pasted half the title so immediately we clock this is not a real journal this is just some form of spam solicitation to try and eek some money out of me. And so this is an issue that's widespread in, in academia and medicine, um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about it today. So esteemed Professor Thompson is not actually uh, a professor. My mum claims I am, but I'm not. Um, but so as Nadia kindly said, my background is as a lecturer in medical science at the University of Exeter. And whilst my research is predominantly in the area of clinical exercise physiology, a very applied fields looking at how we utilize testing and training for the benefit of patient groups. I've also got a real interest in um, how people understand evidence and as part of my duties as a, as a lecturer I teach year one medical students and this is something we try to really put across from day one in their careers and think about what is best evidence and how we go about appraising the quality of research that we are reading. And so something like this, the, the issue of spam and predatory journals is something that is really of concern for them. So if we kind of go back to why this becomes an issue, so publishing in the 21st century is something that is just exploding. If we go back to the 80s, we maybe had a million papers published per year, if that. Um, but now with the advances in technology, the preponderance of the internet and open access journals, um, the most recent count was over 7 million papers published in 2014 with over 34,000 active journals. And this is the most recent update I was able to find um, from Fry and Goostring. But we also see the rise of mega publishers as well. So journals such as Plus One have plotted their, their, their annual outputs from 2007 onwards. And we can see at their peak, this singular journal was publishing over 30,000 articles. And it's not just organizations like Plus One, we have groups like the, the BMJ Open uh, as well, which is a real mega publisher publishing thousands of articles every single year. So we can see there's a rise in the volume of work being produced. Um, and so what this results in is almost uh, a pressure to publish as well. So we need to publish as academics to disseminate our experimental results. We often 
as early career researchers or even senior researchers need these publications for our careers, for our promotions, even probations as well. Institutionally, such publications are really important at evaluating our departments and our teams uh, and the university as a whole. So things like the Research Excellence Framework, where we bring together high quality or high impact articles to assess an institution as a whole. And so therefore we have lots of different factors that will factor in where we decide to publish our results. Is it done for true science? Is it done for personal gain? Is it to being done because we're being told to in effect? And so reviews and uh, qualitative study survey work has nicely kind of broken it down into uh, several different areas of where we decide to publish. Sometimes these are purely logistical reasons. You know, is it a cheap journal to submit to? Do we get a quick turnaround from them in terms of a desk reject or a peer review? Are we genuinely being invited for a special issue by colleagues, by editors? Is it an easy platform to use? Does it use format free submissions, for example? Sometimes there are academic reasons. You might be a member of a learned society and you get a discount on where you submit or you're encouraged to submit to the scholarly journal. Does it target a particular readership that you're interested in? If I am a physiologist, I am more inclined to publish in physiology journals. Is there a prestige or an impact factor associated with it that you want to try and target? But then equally, there are personal reasons as to where we would target as well. Sometimes we perceive ourselves to not be competent enough to target a higher impact journal. We might not have the training associated with submissions or understanding what constitutes a good journal. Do we have inherent biases of whether we feel like we would get accepted or not? If we don't think we will, do we even bother trying? And sometimes as well, if we need an article for promotion or probation, do we go somewhere high impact and risk rejection or do we go somewhere low impact and guarantee an acceptance just so we can say we have that journal and therefore pass probations and promotions? So off the back of this litany uh, of reasons of where we decide to submit, this is where the role of predatory publishers starts to creep in and they often spam us uh, you know, through our university inboxes and saying, please submit to X, Y and Z. Um, and so for this talk, spam journals, predatory journals are, are somewhat interchangeable. But these journals have very questionable business practices, very minimal academic rigor. Fundamentally, they are in the business of soliciting money out of us as an individual or our university for the privilege uh, of having uh, an article published. So what is an issue is that there is a real lacking definition for universally understanding what these journals are. Sometimes the term illegitimate journal is used, predatory is used as well, spam is used, but we all fundamentally understand that these, uh, I hate to use the term business, but these businesses uh, operate outside the traditional publication model um, and have no real interest in the advancement of science. And so even deeper than this, as opposed to just their, their business model of get money, is the actual articles they publish are often deficient in reporting methods and often ethics as well. They don't include ethics statements or make any kind of checks on the ethical processes conducted within experiments. And actually there's a notion now that actually submitting to these journals deliberately could be construed as academic misconduct. Why would somebody deliberately circumvent peer review? And that in itself is a very legitimate question. We see that unfortunately these journals are starting to creep into biomedical databases. And as a result, if we see something that pops up via a PubMed search, for example, this can create the, the um, impression that it is a legitimate publisher, legitimate results and good science. And therefore, if we're accidentally interpreting this information from a, a spam journal, into our practice, this can have a very real and negative impact upon our patients' care and the communities that we serve. Also dealing with these uh, journals on a day-to-day -day basis reduces our academic productivity. How many hours a week or a month do we all spend as academics looking at these emails in our inbox 
and trying to delete them, send them to spam, trying to unsubscribe, trying to get rid of them. Actually, we are losing a lot of productivity. And we also see that senior academics with a wider web presence are more likely to be spammed by these uh, by these predators as well. But whilst that does happen, it also means that early career researchers are not immune to this phenomenon as well. And as we typically as ECRs have less training, or as we go through our training as academics, this is another thing that we will have to look out for uh, and identify how best we tackle this moving forward to make sure we don't fall victim. And so the notion of predatory publishers was really kind of first brought to the fore by Jeffrey Beale, and he was a librarian at the University of Colorado. He's now retired, but he established the first list of potentially predatory open access publishers after identifying some patterns in some of these uh, publishers and how they try to go about soliciting uh, submissions and works. And so in 2011, he only had 18 publishers on his list. Five years later, in 2016, he had over 900 potentially predatory open access publishers. And so this was really the first attempt to try and establish criteria for journals to be declared predatory. What kind of practices do they have or what kind of characteristics do they exhibit to make sure that they will be defined as predatory, illegitimate or, or spam? So Beale's list is now uh, is no longer active, so it has been archived uh, by members of the academic community. So this is not really regularly updated, but it provides us with a fantastic start point into what to look for and what kind of publishers might be declared predatory. And within his framework, he came up with a series uh, of points that would help us identify whether a journal was predatory, such as its editorial board. Does it have an editor? Does it have editorial staff? We often see that these these journals do not have an, any kind of editorial staff, or if they do, it is a very small handful, typically from the same institution. Do they have any kind of business management model? Uh, do they have any kind of statements on integrity? Do they are they consistent in what they do, how they do it, what they publish as well? Often they will have jump from topic to topic just to try and solicit submissions in a broad remit. Do they have very high, unreasonable, unexpected costs? Sometimes we will see an email say that you have free submission, free publication, but you have to pay a very high processing fee. So it kind of hides these costs. Minimal standards, perhaps, or even minimal peer review lack of peer review as well. And so whilst these were the initial criteria set forth by Jeffrey Beale himself, where uh, publishers time, tend to just seek money over any kind of ethical or scientific standards. This was one person's opinions. Um, and so then work subsequently by Samantha Kukia at the University of Ottawa um, has kind of pulled together a consensus statement on what uh, characteristics we should be looking out for to identify whether a journal is predatory or not. And whilst a lot of these are the same, this just provides a wider pool of expertise in helping bring together this definition. So I'd certainly recommend uh, looking at this article in BMJ Open. So when we look at what people have experienced, you know, we all probably sympathise and empathise with this phenomenon, but it's also reassuring to kind of hear what others have had to deal with it as well. So this was a uh, study conducted in 2018 by Eric Mercier and, and as, a, as an early career researcher, what he did is he collated all the publications that he received over the course of one year and just worked out, you know, what are they? Where are they coming from? Who is sending them? What are they trying to get money out of me for? Um, and so what was very interesting is that this spike in articles came almost immediately after the publication of a peer reviewed article into the literature, which had their email address attached to it. So as soon as that email address was put out into the ether, these predators were able to scour the web, crawl the web, pick up this email and start sending uh, spam emails and try and solicit these submissions from this author. And we can see from this plot, there was kind of a consistent 
increase in the number of uh, spam emails being sent to this author. And so what they're very nicely did is characterize how many were coming from journals, from conferences, or any kind of other uh, kind of spam emails. All they did was fundamentally characterize what happens to one early career researcher over the course of a year. What we've also seen is this study from uh, Sasha Mazzarello, again, acknowledged that this individual was receiving a high volume of spam emails, but tried to describe how they wanted to unsubscribe and stop them. And so it started out by using the links embedded with many of these emails where it says unsubscribe here, click that, send a polite email, please unsubscribe me from your mailing list. Uh, and fundamentally, this worked to an extent, but not massively so. So then what they decided to do is kind of up the ante, so to speak, uh, and use fundamentally a legally threatening email. So uh, Sasha was based in Canada, so using changes in Canadian anti-spam legislation, wrote this very brief message back to these spammers. We have asked to be unsubscribed from the mailing list. You have failed. So as per anti-spam laws, if any further emails come, you'll be reported to the Canadian anti-spam legislation. And so this threatening but direct email and approach seems to do the trick so we can see the plots here after threatening legal action this approach was able to completely eliminate all the spam emails this individual was receiving so on the surface this seems like a fantastic approach to use so i thought to myself after receiving hundreds of these and perhaps in a in a fit of boredom over one summer i thought to myself well is, is this something that i could i could do as well so what I've done is I sourced to actually combine the two approaches used by Eric Mercier and Sasha Mazzarello in that, can I describe how many emails I receive as an early career researcher, but also can I stop this as well? So how can we try and solve this issue by combining both approaches? And so I've recently had this work published in uh, Learned Publishing uh, at the beginning of this year. And what I fundamentally did is I collated every single spam email I've received as an early career researcher. So I started my PhD at the University of Exeter at a tail end of 2013. And so I collated all the emails right through to the end of 2021. And so what I observed was that fundamentally for the first four years of my PhD, so I took I did my PhD part time, I had a uh, it was a five year process for me in total. I had zero spam for my first four years of my doctorate. And then literally as soon as I submitted my first conference registration, that is when the first spam email popped up into my inbox. So relatively, this only happened kind of pre six weeks before the enforcement of European wide GDPR uh, legislation. So it kind of snuck in before there. Um, but then what I also saw is kind of characterized by B on this plot is as soon as I submitted my first publication with my contact details attached, whereby my email was on that publication, I saw this massive spike in soliciting emails as well, much like Eric Mercier did. And so I thought, right, we're seeing this increase in spam emails. What do we do about it? So using Beale's list to identify what might contribute as a predatory publisher, and something called a Macrosti's criteria for uh, spam conferences, I started to characterize, are these emails that I'm receiving true invitations or are they spam? Um, but eventually they were all spam. And what was very interesting is after I published this journal article, the ratio of predatory publishers to predatory conferences shifted. So I started out receiving quite a lot of conference invitations because my email was only associated um, with these predators in terms of conferences. Then as soon as I was publishing work, suddenly my name was associated with academic journals as well. And so what was very interesting as well is some of the initial requests uh, that I received were very, very outside my wheelhouse being asked to submit to the Journal of Nuclear Science and Forensic Science and Criminal Investigation, um, you know, being asked to submit to current advances in geology 
and geoscience. So again, there's nothing to do with medicine, physiology or respiratory kind of health that I'm particularly interested in. Um, but as time has gone on, these requests are becoming far more specific as the titles of my articles are able to inform how spam emails can be constructed to try and trap me here as well. So looking at all these emails that I've received, so over this period of time through to the end of my postdoc in 2021, I received 1,280 spam emails and the overwhelming majority of these were related to journal submissions. So asking me to submit novel work or replicated work to a journal. But I also receive a high number of conference invitations, invitations to undertake peer review, write books, join editorial boards as well. And what's really interesting is to republish existing work that fundamentally asks me, you've written this article, can you just republish it, no changes, and just put it into our journal as well. So very clear cases of requested plagiarism as well, which is quite worrying. So within this um, kind of breakdown, if we look at the journal articles that I've been uh, requested to submit to, there's some really interesting characteristics starting to creep through in that an overwhelming majority um, have a deadline. They say, please submit by the end of next week. Please submit within two weeks. They place quite a strict deadline. Um, some whilst they offer the option to subscribe, don't actually follow through with any kind of promises or logistical processes there. Um, they often lack things like impact factors or details. And what was very interesting again is of all these journal articles, over 200 actually made explicit reference to my existing works. They said, we have noticed you have published this particular article in this particular journal. Can you give us something similar? So there's how this process happens, whether it's just a web crawl exercise or there's somebody at the other end of this specifically reading and copying and pasting data. I'm not sure, but this specificity and this individualization of these emails makes it a little bit harder again to discern what is spam and what is not spam. If you see something with your name, your existing publication in your field, are you more likely to try, fall victim and, and end up submitting? This is something we have to be aware of. What we also see with these conferences that we're being asked to subscribe, uh, submit to, um, more often than not, you've been invited as a speaker or often as a chair, not very often as just plainly a delegate. For some reason, all the conferences I was being invited to, the majority were in Japan. No idea why, just it would happen to be the location. Again, many provide an option to unsubscribe, it didn't follow through with this. Uh, and what was, again, a further interesting uh, kind of observation was all from 2020 onwards, and this is where I identified a spike in the number of online conferences being advertised uh, and kind of spam emails being sent for as well. So obviously uh, in reflection and hindsight of the COVID pandemic where a lot of activities and learned societies were moving online as well. So again, the predators are reacting to current affairs as well in offering these online conferences. So what I did is I know what emails I'm getting, can I stop it? Can I unsubscribe successfully? So what I did is I used um, kind of all my data up until 2020. Um, basically, I did not unsubscribe from any of that. And I used 2020 as a de facto control year. I just left that as it is. But then once January 1st, 2021 clicked around, this is the year I was going to unsubscribe. And this is where I took to tiered approach, much, my, much like uh, Sasha Mazzarello, in that I first off for the first four months of 2021, so from January through to the end of April, I literally just clicked unsubscribe in those emails where it was possible to. Sometimes there were dead links, malicious links that I didn't follow through with, um, but for the majority, I was able to click unsubscribe uh, and use that as a mechanism to remove myself from emailing lists. After that, in the next four months, I kind of upped the ante and I ended up sending emails back. So I clicked reply and just literally put unsubscribe as my message, unsubscribe, 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 just to kind of get me off your mailing list. Uh, but with no more context, literally unsubscribe. Um, and then 
after that, for the remaining four months of the year, uh, so from September through to the end of December, I took kind of the threatening approach exhibited by Sasha Mazzarello uh, with kind of explicit details uh, of what can happen with regards to the Information Commissioner's Office here in the UK. And so this was the email that I sent. So I had written this, so after seeking advice um, from the Information Commissioner here in the UK and kind of what any kind of legal recourse may be, this is what I've written. And this is actually a draft email that the ICO actually provides people to use. This is a template recommended uh, to be used as well. And so the big kind of bold bit here in the middle was the key thing I was hoping people would read. And this I deliberately bolded this back to the spammers. So please cease from sending further emails to this address and unsubscribe me from all lists. And said further emails received may be passed to the UK ICO. So I only said may be passed on, not that they will. Fundamentally, I'm using my institutional account, so I do have to have kind of a, a level of academic progress protection as well and protect my institution. So I just said maybe to kind of remove any kind of true legal recourse, but hopefully this still kind of really hits home and hammers the point of these kind of spam emails are not acceptable. Please, please stop. So how did this work? So in 2020, I received 563 emails. This is my de facto control year. I just didn't do anything, just let, let those spam emails be. 2021, I actually received more emails than the year before. But we actually see as we went through the year and once I started employing this legally threatening approach, there was around about a 40% reduction in the number of emails I was receiving. However, this is still 140 odd emails over a four month period. So it's not dropped all the way down to zero like it did in the Mazzarello study. I'm still receiving a high number of spam requests. And interestingly, of the 593 emails that I received and subsequently responded to in some fashion, only one of those requests was acknowledged. So I think this tells an interesting story in that these publishers don't either they don't care or they don't adhere to any kind of business process, etiquette or kind of uh, legal framework as well. So this is interesting and disappointing uh, in equal measure. So what we saw is that this approach worked, I say worked relative to the prime months, but in the grand scheme of things, it didn't. So unfortunately, my message to you as as listeners and early career researchers, senior academics is don't bother trying to unsubscribe. Um, and then they put these straight into your junk folder hope for the best or you can be like me get frustrated and bored uh, and analyze it um, <laughs> which i thought was a, a niche way to get around it so unfortunately this this didn't work but what this also gave me was some interesting insight into these predators themselves so where these predators were able to kind of identify enough information about themselves so i could garner more information so whether they provide uh, an address in their email signature whether I'm able to find the name of the publisher online and just do a basic Google search on them. I was able to identify that actually the locations of these is very widespread, but the majority were interestingly based in the United States. So bearing in mind, the gut feel might be that actually these predators are based not in kind of advanced OECD countries, but maybe elsewhere in the world. Actually, we see the overall majority of myself were based in the United States. And then within that, once we do a state by state breakdown, we saw the majority of these publishers were based in the state of Delaware. And this is a pattern I was starting to pick up. And I thought, this, you know, this is a bit strange. There's something going on here. Why do 22 publishers all sit in Delaware? And interestingly, six publishers representing 47 different journals gave the exact same address within the state. So how do we have 47 journals, six publishers, all in the same building, in the same room somewhere in Delaware? This does not make sense. What is going on? So I've decided to dig uh, a little bit deeper, kind of employ my journalistic investigatory brain. And this one address that represents these 47 journals, these six publishers, 
16192 Coastal Highway, Lewis, Delaware. So we can see it is kind of sandwiched between a dermatology clinic and a good morning breakfast nook. So, you know, what is on this highway? There is no way we have six publishers based here on this highway. Go on to Google View and we actually find this building, DelawareIncorporated.com. This is 16192 uh, Coastal Highway Road, Lewis, Delaware. What is this building? How do we have so many publishers in this single story room? And again, further investigation reveals this is fundamentally a, a middleman. This is a company that allows other institutions, individuals, businesses to register in the state of Delaware. So we have this group called Harvard Business Services Incorporated, which is interestingly not associated with Harvard University or the state of Delaware. So they're just preying on names and hoping for the best. But we can see now, you know, for the price of $179, I can incorporate my business in Delaware now. So is this what these predators and these spammers are doing? You know, how can they get away with this? You know, this seems very strange and very, very dodgy. So we ask, you know, what is special about Delaware? You know, the birthplace of uh, of Joe Biden, you know, so American president is from Delaware, he's a senator for the state for many, many years. And our initial assumption might be that do we have tax breaks or any kind of financial benefit to registering in the state of Delaware? Why not any of the other 14 states? But what we actually see is Delaware is a very business friendly state and any owner or manager of a business does not need to be a US citizen to register within the state. You don't even need to be based within the United States to register there. So I here in my house in the UK, I could now go and register and incorporate a business in the United States in the state of Delaware with no further issues. And that is fundamentally what's happening. As a result, there are over a million businesses registered within the state. And for a state that only has a population of one million itself, that is one business per person. Very clearly, not every person in the state has their own business. There are other businesses being registered from elsewhere. It is a very business friendly state, which has a lot of judiciary and kind of legal precedent as well. It has its own kind of um, series of professional judges that only rule on business cases and so forth. So it is a very kind of um, friendly state with that regard. And so if we come back to one of Beale's criteria in helping to define uh, a predatory journal, one of the things that he um, that he recognised was that these journals tend to or they appear to operate in a Western country for the purposes of functioning as a vanity press. So they might use a mail drop or a PO or address box in the United States whilst actually operating from another country. And so this is what we can see is happening in this case with these 22 publishers based in Delaware. We can safely assume that they are not actually based in the United States. Are they based elsewhere in the world and uh, appearing to use Delaware to give this uh, air of legitimacy? So what this means is that we are fundamentally, we are unsure where these predators are truly operating from. Are they in the US? Are they elsewhere in the world? And this therefore limits any kind of corrective action individual governments could take. If it is a business that is truly in the United States, we could rely on the US to try and do something. But if it's registered in the US, operated from elsewhere, you know, whose government is responsible? And does this in turn exacerbate the cycle and actually make it impossible to stop the predators? So this then fundamentally leaves action up to us as academics. So what do we do? Fundamentally, the most important thing is to not submit. Do not submit to these predators. But we've also got to be able to spot who they are. And actually, this can be quite a tricky process. And so one of the things we need to think about is education. How do we teach our trainees, our students what to look out for? And there's a wider philosophical question of can we and should we use these studies in research as well? So how do we go about spotting these predators, these illegitimate publishers? And we have a couple of options open to us fundamentally in the notion of blacklists and whitelists. So a blacklist is a naughty list. If you're on a blacklist, you are not a good publisher. These are ones that have been identified to be undesirable, have unethical 
practices or are deceptive, they might use aggressive marketing like these spam emails we all receive. They might not have peer review. So Beal's list is a classic example of a blacklist. He has compiled this list of naughty, naughty publishers. And if you're on it, you are perceived to be a predator. Cables Analytics also operates his own blacklist as well. But on the flip side, we also have a whitelist. This is an approved list. This is whereby you have been identified to adhere to good practices, things like peer review. We have explicit policies on licensing or archiving retractions, whatever it may be. And so something like the Directory of Open Access Journals is an example of a whitelist. So if you're on that list, you are approved, you are good to go. Cables also operates its own version of a whitelist as well. So we can see there's different organisations taking marginally different approaches. But with this approach of having blacklists and whitelists, this in itself isn't dichotomous, it isn't black and white. What we unfortunately do see is there is a mild overlap between some of these publishers. So this was a fantastic study conducted by Stringsdall and colleagues in 2019 where we look at the overlap between Beale's blacklist, Cable's blacklist, Cable's whitelist, and the directory of open access journals or whitelist. And we can see that down the bottom, the overlap between Beale and the DOAJ, this little box at the bottom with 19 in it, there are 19 journals that simultaneously exist on Beale's blacklist and the DOAJ. So this fundamentally has an overlap between blacklist and whitelist. So this creates a gray zone. So what do we do with these 19 that are in the grey zone? Do we use them? Do we not use them? We need better definitions of what constitutes a journal to go on the blacklist or the whitelist. And equally, it's down to the journal themselves to ensure they're on the correct list as well. I know if I was an editor of something in the grey zone, I would try my hardest to make sure I'm removed from the blacklist and maintain my position on the whitelist. But then if we look at the 19 that are in the grey zone, what we actually see is for a based or claims to be based in the United States. We mentioned some of the issues there with registering companies uh, when you're not actually based in the US. But then we see other countries such as Turkey, the UAE, India, China, Kenya, Singapore, Egypt. The majority of these come whereby English is not the main uh, kind of the main majority language. Some of these are not considered kind of um, advanced countries by the OECD. So they are non high income countries. Are we inadvertently biasing against developing countries? Is this some kind of prejudice that we need to be working against? And if we look at some of the journals that are listed in this grey zone, things like the Mediter Mediterranean Journal of Chemistry, um, we can also see the Journal of Evidence Based Medicine and Healthcare based out of India. There, we might initially think these have a spam illegitimate feel to them, but they're actually on the DOAJ. So they have, they adhere to these benchmarks that we set forward in terms of peer review and archiving and having these due processes within editorial board. So what is our answer? And I wish I could give you a, a straightforward answer, but there is one. This is where we have to really start thinking wider as a whole community. Now we do have options open to us, um, things like checklists. So whilst these blacklists and whitelists are very useful to spot who might be a legitimate or illegitimate publisher, some of the checklists are not useful. You know, so Beals is dated uh, and is fundamentally archived ever since he retired. Cable's whitelist blacklist actually requires a subscription fee. So then the only up to date open one is the DOAJ. But again, this as an area where there is a grey zone. So this is where we have to kind of think about uh, placing the onus on us as individual researchers. You know, do we use checklists like Think, Check, Submit, which are used to identify legitimate publishers and just ensure what we are looking for in terms of a, uh, where we submit our work? But then to identify illegitimate predatory publishers, we actually see there are 93 different checklists currently available, and these are published either by academic journals themselves, university librarians. Um, and this is again, Samantha Cookie at Ottawa undertook this systematic review to look at what are the characteristics of these checklists and found that actually only three of the 93 produced 
are evidence based, the rest are predominantly opinion based. And whilst they all cover broadly similar themes, how they operate in their editorial boards, peer review, comms, how much do they charge, do they claim to have impact factors or be indexed in certain libraries and databases, there's still discrepancy in how these checklists are used. So do we then always have to go back to only using white lists if these blacklist checks don't really pan out? Um, and so again, this places a real onus on us as individuals and, and many people listening as PIs and how you train individuals in your lab. And what we unfortunately see is these awarenesses of blacklists and whitelists. The concept of predatory publishers really does vary field by field. As I say, I'm, I'm based in medical science myself and I teach the doctors of tomorrow, but we actually see awareness amongst medical students is only around 10% you know, are aware of the term predatory publisher. As so what we see, education can be effective. Uh, and more often than not, the case studies that we see in case examples of how education occurs is led by librarians that are kind of the unsung heroes of academia. These folks you know so much about databases and kind of what kind of checklists are available. So let's use librarians uh, to our advantage and let them use their expertise to teach us and guide us at the same time. But fundamentally, the best format or content to teach somebody about predatory publishers isn't known because we are still lacking universal definitions of what they are. More often than not, it's still based on a gut feel. Does this look right? Does it adhere to some kind of framework or standard? But then there is also a wider question of well, what do we do with the data and the studies published within these predatory journals? Could we use it? Should? We use it does if we cite something from a predator, does it legitimize these operations actually lend credence and further exacerbate the cycle? And actually, this is going to become more of an issue because of the infiltration of some predators into biomedical databases, whereby if we run a systematic review, so we do a search through PubMed, for example, if we inadvertently include a predatory publication, you know, is do we use it? Do we not use it? It's fundamentally come via PubMed, a legitimate database. So suddenly, do we have to add extra steps into our systematic reviews in terms of screening data? We might have something that fits inclusion exclusion criteria in terms of a study design, but then do we need to go back to the source material and identify what journal it was published in and do further checks that way? Uh, and there are also kind of fields of thought in that, well, is there philosophically much of a difference between a predatory journal and a preprint in that we could argue neither have been peer reviewed? So some predatory publishers will utilize peer review. The, the rigor and the thoroughness of that is unknown and to be debated, but equally preprints are there because they have not been peer reviewed. There is an intention to peer review, but if we assume predators are not, preprints are not, is there a difference you know and so i think most of us would inherently feel that there is in preprint because of the intention to review is you know more robust but there is an argument and a wider philosophical debate to be had so if we include preprints should we or could we also include predators as well and i think it's an interesting point but i've also spoken a lot about the the predatory publishers but we also must acknowledge predatory conferences as well and you know it's well and good to kind of have that email asking you to attend somewhere, but you want to be able to make sure that you're attending a legitimate conference. And so these approaches are very similar to predatory publishers in that they try and submit, uh, solicit submissions in exchange for a conference registration fee. Uh, and at the end of the day, sometimes these conferences can take place very, very badly and disorganized or even not at all. They can just be a straight up fraudulent operation, take your money and run. Um, what we do see is the checklists used for defining predatory conferences are not the same detail as publishers yet. So there's more work to be done in this area, but this is a fantastic kind of little insight uh, into the operation of a fake conference done by Rory McKenzie, where he, as, as a scientific communicator and journalist, effectively blagged his way into a fake conference in being hosted in Edinburgh. Uh, and it's a great little read if you get a couple of minutes to yourself. But then equally, you know, what do we look out for in these scenarios? And this is a, a 
a spam email I received very, very recently asking me to attend the Respiratory Disease and Health Conference in Portugal. Never been to Portugal, would be a lovely place to go. But then we can see it is addressed, dear friends and colleagues, and then it is personalised by using one of my most recent papers. But again, we can see underlined in red, they've only copied and pasted half the title. So immediately this is making a little bit of a red flag in my mind. Is this a real legitimate conference? And if you search the conference, search the supplier, we can see not only do we have the Respiratory Disease and Health Conference happening on July 17th to 19th in Lisbon, Portugal, but we've also got a oral and dental medicine, endobolism and diabetes, orthopedics, cancer and cardiology conferences all happening on the exact same dates in the exact same place from the exact same conference provider. So how are they hosting six conferences all at once over the same two days? They're clearly not. Uh, so this is very clearly a spam operation. And so like most academics, we get frustrated um, and kind of really off put by these. So it's always quite nice to fight fire with fire and have a little bit of fun yourself. And so last year I was uh, for some reason asked to submit uh, an abstract to global experts meet on astronomy and astrophysics. So I'm a physiologist. I am not an astronomer by any stretch of the imagination. So on my summer holiday, my wife wasn't exactly overly impressed that I was doing this with my downtime, but I thought I'm going to have a little bit of fun. Uh, so I set up a separate email address to kind of absolve my institution of any recourse and responsibility. Went onto Gmail, created an account uh, and tried to have a little bit of fun. And lo and behold, next thing you know, James T. Kirk, uh, is now presenting at the expert meet on astronomy and astrophysics, preaching about the troublesome tribbles. Uh, and so I thought to myself, you know, how far can I kind of push this? And I ended up sending quite a few emails to the organisers posing to be Captain Kirk, uh, and they lapped it up, um, enjoyed it, and they stopped just short of paying my travel. So I almost had them in the palm of my hand, free trip to Paris, but not quite. But it shows that, that there is just zero checks it is an immediate accept. It's a copy paste from any information you give them and it's put straight onto these websites to end uh, to kind of uh, give uh, an air of legitimacy to some of these issues as well. So, um, you know, have fun, be responsible, but it also shows that these aren't real conferences um, at all. So in summary, we kind of know what to look out for. We're aware of an issue in academia with the spam journals in these predators but unsubscribing really just does not work so i'm going to hopefully save you guys the effort and just put it recommend you just put it all straight in your junk folder and hope for the best and equally unfortunately th this problem's not going away uh, it's going to be here for a, a significant period of time and if anything only get worse this is where it's going to require a wider collaboration as an academic community to make sure we're looking after each other our teams our lab groups but also science as a whole and making sure these predators don't infiltrate the the the, the academy uh, any further at all. So, just like to finish by saying thank you to uh, the Riot Science Club, to, to Nadia and Ellie for inviting me to talk today, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions if there are any. Uh, thank you ever so much. <laughs>